Last week we took a passage, took a look at a passage, much like this one out of John chapter 9. Some of you were with us and will remember that. It was about a man who was born blind. And in that account we hear about Jesus healing a man who was blind from birth. And one of the most striking things that we heard in that story was that his blindness was not a result of sin. If you remember me talking about this, right? The disciples see him along the road and they say, who sinned to, to make this man blind, him or his parents? And Jesus said it was not something that was given to him because he sinned or because he did something wrong, nor was it uh, his plight because his parents sinned. He was blind so that the works of God could be displayed in his life, Jesus said. And last week I wanted to try and help you see how there was purpose in this blind man's pain. How it wasn't arbitrary or meaningless. There was a purpose. God was at work in it and through it for good. And I shared with you how all of that was a good thing, right? That even though this man had many years of pain, God was doing something bigger and that that was good. And how that knowledge has the power to transform our experience of suffering. If we have a sense of purpose and meaning in it, it can transform our suffering. We know that pain has a point. It doesn't remove the suffering, but it fills it with hope. So as believers, we go through pain with hope because we believe that it's not meaningless, that it is accomplishing something good and significant, even if we can't see it or understand it. Now this morning we find ourselves looking at a similar passage in John 11. We've already read the account, so we've heard the story. But what strikes me yet again as I read this account is that here again we're faced with a hard, tragic situation filled with pain. And Jesus says in verse 4 almost exactly what he said in, in John 9 last week. That this is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Two stories of pain, just a couple of chapters apart, and Jesus says in both that there is a bigger purpose, something good that he's bringing out of these hard things. But this story this week is going to give us more of a glimpse of Jesus than the story last week. Last week, much of the story was focused on the Pharisees interrogating the man and his parents. And this week we're going to get to see a bit more of, of Jesus. The story unfolds in what we might call three acts or scenes. And in each of these scenes, Jesus is going to do something remarkable. In the first scene of our story today, Jesus is going to show us a different kind of love. He's going to show us that love is not what we tend to think it is. And then in the second scene, we're going to learn something from Jesus' emotional reaction to some of what is happening at the funeral. We're going to learn that pain is often given to us so that we will see and have more of Jesus. And then in the final scene, we're going to see that when we put our trust in Jesus, we too will be raised to new life, just as Lazarus was. So let's take a look at the first scene together. The first scene is in verses 1 through 16. This is the scene where Jesus is with the disciples and, and he first hears the news about Lazarus being sick. So Lazarus is ill, and again, right up front we're told that. But instead of getting up immediately and going to heal him or to be with the family, which is probably what most of us would expect, right? That Jesus would hear this news that someone he loved is ill and he would get right up and go. But John tells us in verse 6 that Jesus stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then suddenly he says, Jesus decides to, to get up and go to, to Judea to see him. Now Jesus, at the time of the story, when it starts, he's, uh, we're not exactly sure where he is. Maybe he's up in Galilee. But they're going to the town of Bethany, which is where Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus Lived And it's just a couple of miles away from Jerusalem, which is why Thomas there is saying, you were just there, Jesus, and they were threatening to kill you, and you want to go right back? And so the, the disciples are kind of arguing with Jesus 
You know, why, why do you want to go right back to this place? Uh, but Jesus responds by saying, we walk in the light and we won't stumble. He's basically, don't worry about it, okay, is what he's saying here. Then he adds in verses 11 through 16 that Lazarus is asleep. And like we've seen in so many of the stories prior to this with the woman at the well and some of the others, the disciples don't get it, right? They take him right on the surface of what he's saying and they say, oh, well, it's going to be all right then. Don't worry about him. Maybe implying we don't need to go if he's just sleeping and he'll recover. Um, well, finally, Jesus just says, no, Lazarus now has died. And he says, uh, you know, we're going to go and we're going we're to be with the family and raise him up. Uh, so by the time Jesus gets there uh, in Bethany, uh, Lazarus is already dead. He's been dead for several days. And uh, so verse 17, when they arrive, he's been in the tomb for four days. And so most likely wherever Jesus and the disciples uh, were at the time, it was a decent walk, maybe of a day or two. Again, that's why we think maybe they're in Galilee or somewhere like that. But Jesus arrives on the scene and he's late, right? At least by our standards and by Martha and Mary and the family's standards. In verse 21, she goes up to Jesus and basically says to him in so many words, Jesus, you're late. Where were you? If you would have been here, if you'd have gotten here on time, maybe Lazarus wouldn't be dead. And then Jesus basically responds by saying, no, I'm right on time. I'm never late. God is up to something here and you're going to get to see it. But what does all of this tell us? There's something I think here for us in this whole opening act or scene where we see Jesus waiting to allow Lazarus to die. Jesus stayed two more days and then he had the travel time and whatnot to get there. Maybe we think that, that that's a bit harsh or insensitive of Jesus. Doesn't look like he had anything else to do, right? He, didn't have other errands, and maybe there wasn't a crowd at the time around him, so he was delayed. From all we know, Jesus and the disciples are grilling hot dogs and eating falafel and hanging out by the shore, for all we know. We look at this and we think that maybe Jesus is being harsh or negligent in some way. But let's look a little closer. I want you to notice verse 5 with me. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, and Lazarus. Whatever is happening here, Jesus loved these people. And he was acting in love for the people that were grieving and suffering. And actually, it's worth pointing out here that uh, the, one of the Greek words right there at the front of verse 6 is the word, therefore. I think the ESV has it as so. Um, some translations have yet or, or maybe then. Uh, the King James has, when he had heard, therefore. Uh, so they moved the therefore a little further into the sentence. But isn't it interesting, though, that the way it's, it's worded here in John 11, um, again, thinking of that, that first word there in the sentence as therefore, uh, it tells us that Jesus waited two more days because he loved them. And because of his love, he waited Here's how it reads in the old King James. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Jesus stayed longer until Lazarus passed away because he loved them. Wow, we might think. Either... This is wrong, and Jesus did not, in fact, love them. Or we maybe have some wrong ideas about what love is and what it does. If this is true, however, then, and we assume, of course, that that's our perspective as believers, right? That this testimony is true and that Jesus was a man of great love. He was love incarnate. Everything he did was motivated in and by love. Then if that's right, then love doesn't always shield us from harm. Love doesn't always prevent the disaster. Love doesn't always just make things simple and easy for us. Love is different. Love's goals are different maybe than what we think or assume on the surface, at least speaking for myself and, 
and I think for our culture here in America. Well, look at Jesus' goals in this passage. So we wonder, okay, well, what is Jesus doing here? So he's motivated by love, and he waited until Lazarus passed, but why? Well, look at verses 14 and 15 with me. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, he says. But let us go to him. Jesus' goal in loving the disciples was that they would believe. He did things the way he did here so that God would be glorified and they would believe. Jesus wanted to spark faith. He wanted them to know God. And this difficult road was the way. So that's the first scene. We see that Jesus loves differently maybe than what we expect. That love is something different than what we expect. The second scene, let's move to that now. Now, in the second scene, we're gonna, this is going to be in verses uh, 17 through 38. This portion of our story takes place in Bethany. So Jesus has now arrived on the scene, and the disciples are there with him, and Mary and Martha. And we're going to get to see this, this really interesting and amazing interaction between Jesus and Martha and Jesus and Mary. And first it's Martha. She hears that Jesus has arrived and she runs out to meet him. Jesus hasn't even fully gotten into the city yet. He's still out on the road leading up to the city. And the people hear that he's coming and they're all out there in the streets. Uh, But Jesus and Martha had this really interesting exchange. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Put that question to you. Do you believe these words of Jesus And then Mary comes out right after this exchange with Martha and basically says the same thing to Jesus. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But when Mary comes, many others follow her. She falls at his feet and she is sobbing at this point. She's weeping and the others there are doing the same. This is a highly emotional moment. Maybe try and imagine What is going on here? I mean, you can almost picture it. Mourners gathered around. Jesus, where were you, Jesus? He died. Where were you? Why weren't you here? I mean, you can hear it. You can see it, the sobbing and and the grief and people maybe pressing these questions on Jesus. Why didn't you come and, and, and heal Lazarus and prevent this whole disaster? And Jesus sees Mary and the others there and And he weeps. Now most of us, when we come to this section of the story, that's probably what we're going to see. That's the part that we're going to notice and it's going to stand out to us. Jesus weeping. I know that's the case for me. It has been for many years. We remember that. It's a powerful image. The almighty Son of God weeping with the grieving. However, there's much more here in this section. And when we look at everything else that's going on, we get a different picture maybe about why Jesus was weeping. I think our tendency here again, and this includes me, is that we read that Jesus wept and we tend to to kind of assume what that means, right? We maybe posit our own information into those words about what that means, we, we assume maybe what Jesus is feeling and what is going on here. We think, well, this is a funeral and he's empathizing and he's being tender and, and he's being compassionate and is grieving with, with the folks that are there missing Lazarus. But the more I've looked at this passage and listened to others preach and comment on it, the more doubtful I am that that is exactly, actually what's happening here. Because right near the verse where Jesus weeps, John tells us that Jesus was feeling some other things too. 
There are a couple of other big words about Jesus' emotions here that we should pay attention to that I think maybe shed a little more light on, on possibly why Jesus was weeping. Of course, we don't have all the information. We can't peer into the heart and the mind of the Son of God. And, and God's heart and mind are, are so much greater than ours. And, and no doubt He was feeling and thinking many things. Uh, so I don't want to be uh, too rigid in, in how I speak about this, but I want us to look at some of these other words that are present uh, right there around this Jesus weeping uh, verse in 35. He says in verse 33 that Jesus was deeply moved. So that's one of the words I want us to pay attention to. And that he was greatly troubled. And that's another word. And then in verse 38, we hear again that Jesus was deeply moved again, which is the same, same root word as the first one there in verse 33. Again, I think our inclination is to think of these words as words of compassion. But that's not actually what they mean, according to biblical scholars anyway, who spend a lot of time studying the, the meaning of these words and looking at the semantic range and all of that of, of, these, of these Greek words. And in fact, the other places where the first word is used, deeply moved, is uh, never in the New Testament, again, according to these, these scholars who spend a lot of time studying this, it's never used in the New Testament for compassion or tenderness. So the deeply moved word is not, it's not a word of, of tenderness or compassion here. One pastor theologian points out that the word is found three other times outside of John's gospel and in every context, every case, it's used, it's a rebuking word. It's a, a word for scolding or warning. Um, the translators of the, of the NET Bible, the N-E-T Bible, suggest that this could be rendered, he was deeply indignant. So he was upset, angry at this. Um, again, indignation is anger. Only a couple of the translations capture the anger or indignation aspect of this emotion that's present in the Greek verb. The New, the New Living Translation, interestingly, which is normally a looser translation of the text, in this case actually captures that aspect of the Greek word here. And in verse 33, the New Living says this, When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him. And he was deeply troubled. So this word that the ESV translates as deeply moved is not a gentle, tender emotion. Whatever's going on here, it's not, as far as we can tell from the passage here, I don't think a, a, a moment of tenderness. Uh, and, the word, and the other word in the ESV, which it translates greatly troubled, is the same word that's used um, in a number of places of, of troubled or, or, or disturbed. Um, it's actually used in John 5 to describe how the angel would come down and stir up the waters at the pool of Bethesda. The waters were stirred. They were disturbed. And so Jesus was stirred up. He was disturbed and he was feeling some indignation here in this moment. So what does this suggest about the weeping? Does this change the way we view Jesus' weeping in verse 35? I think it should. These other emotional words are found right before the weeping and shortly after the weeping. And all of us know from experience, right, that weeping is not just something that happens when we're grieving or when we're sorrowful, though that may be one of the more common times we have tears come forth. But weeping can happen in a moment of joy or or at a memory, or during frustration, or anger, or any combination of those, right? Tears are a mysterious thing. Sometimes they come out of nowhere. So it's hard to say exactly what is going on here, of course, as I said a moment ago, in the heart and the mind of the Savior. But I just feel that it's an oversimplification to simply say that he's mourning with his friends. I think that's to oversimplify what's happening here. So these emotions that Jesus is feeling, what are they directed at? Why is he feeling these things? Well, look at verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, 
he was deeply moved. There's that deeply moved word. He was deeply indignant or he was um, upset. He was feeling some of this rebuking and, and scolding stuff going on in him. And he was troubled. He was stirred up. And so Mary comes up and says to Jesus, right after that verse there in 33, if you would have only been here, where were you kind of stuff? He sees all of the weeping and then he begins to feel these powerful emotions. D.A. Carson, who's a wonderful uh, Bible scholar and, and teacher, he writes that whatever is happening here, that we, we cannot simply reduce it, he says, to this emotional upset uh, or this emotional upset that's going on here in Jesus. We can't reduce it to the effects of empathy, grief, pain, or the like. And I think there's another clue. Again, trying to get at what it is that's, that's bothering Jesus here. I think there's another clue for us in verses 36 to 38 that may signal what is, what is actually bothering Jesus here. If we look at 36 through 38 with me. So the Jews said, see how he loved them. So again, all of this is rooted in love. I want to continue to, to emphasize that. Whatever Jesus is feeling here, it's love, Okay. Um, but then in the 37, but some of them said, could he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus deeply moved again. It says right after these comments, he's hearing all these comments and people feel free to, to offer their commentary, right? As Jesus shows up, it says that right after he hears these things, de Jesus is deeply moved again. Again, that's that word for the, 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 or the scolding, rebuking word there, and he came to the tomb, it says in verse 38. Again, notice that that deeply moved word happens right after some of the Jews say, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? One can almost hear them supplying their own reasons for why Jesus did not show up and prevent the death. Does he not care? Was he too busy? What does he not know what his friends are going through? I mean, they went and told him and he still didn't come. I wonder if, he, if this is all a big show. If he, I wonder if he really does care. Or if he cares, how much does he care? As I said a moment ago, and as many scholars have said, this thing that Jesus feels here is in response to some of these questions, and it's not a tender emotion. It's not a, a moment of, of compassion or grief. And so Jesus comes to the tomb, and the King James has Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. Or the New Living, which has Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb. That gives us a different picture of what's happening here, doesn't it? But again, why? What was it about these questions and the weeping and all this drama here that has Jesus so stirred and, and bothered? Well, think about it. Let's think about it. Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sisters, and the Jews were essentially questioning Jesus' motives. Why weren't you here, Jesus? I mean, you can hear it, the weeping and what? Why weren't you here? What, why did you allow this, Jesus? What are you doing? They're suspicious of Jesus. They're doubting Jesus. They're questioning his motives, as many of the Jews are there as well. And it appears from what we've seen here that Jesus is angry. He's indignant. And that's his loving response to them questioning his motives. Now we've already established, again, I want to reiterate the first part. In the first scene, we established, uh, when we looked at that part there, that everything Jesus did in waiting and allowing Lazarus to die and not just swooping in and preventing all the pain, that that was done in love because he loved them. He did this and allowed this. And we know that Jesus, again, is the embodiment of love, that he is love incarnate. The Bible teaches that God is love and Jesus is God and he's come down and, 
and taken on flesh, and we know he went to the cross in love, right? All of that was love. So what we are seeing here, this anger, this, this indignation, is also love. Behind it is, is love. Because everything that Jesus did, that he's ever done, was done in love for his people, in love for God. And you say, how can that be, maybe? How can anger be rooted in love? We think of those two as contrary, right? Well, John Piper points out very helpfully that Jesus is angry here because all of the things these people are doing in this moment, the doubts and the suspicions and the questioning his motives, are all the things that keep us from seeing Jesus in our pain. If we don't understand or believe that God has a good purpose in our pain, we will miss Jesus. We will miss God in it all. Now, it's human nature to run away from pain, right? That's, that's understandable. Some of us maybe live our entire lives just trying to avoid pain or conflict. We will bend over backwards to be comfortable. But if that's what you're doing, I'm going to suggest here that you're missing Jesus. Pain is not your enemy. Pain is not the evil thing. It's not the bad guy. Conflict is not the bad guy. Discomfort is not our enemy. We don't like those things, but they're not our enemy. And in fact, the Bible teaches us, which is what we're seeing this week, and we saw last week, and we're going to continue to see this because it's everywhere in the scriptures. In the words of C.S. Lewis, that that pain is God's megaphone to rouse a sleeping world. Pain and suffering and hardship are tools in the hands of a loving God who uses them to expose our real enemies, namely unbelief and sin and death. And let me tell you, that's not only why I think God was doing this here in this moment here in John 11, but I think that is certainly a big part of what, of what God is wanting to do with us right now in the midst of this, this coronavirus outbreak. So that's, this is not only true. What I'm saying here is, is that God uses pain to, to wake us up and to shake us and stir us and, and to reveal what's going on in our hearts. That's not something that's only true for Lazarus and that family right here in, in, in John 11. That's true for us Today, in the midst of, of all of this that's going on around us with the coronavirus, God is at work. God is drawing out our fears. He's drawing out our doubts. He's drawing out where our loyalties lie. Are we putting our trust in Washington or in Jesus Christ? Is our trust in our jobs or our financial security. Again, we talked about these things a little bit last week. Is our trust in our health? Are we putting our trust in those rescue checks that are coming in the mail to some Americans? Or are we trusting in Jesus? Are we putting our trust in a strong economy and in the upcoming election? Is our trust in our medical experts creating a vaccine for the C-19 virus? Where is our trust, people? Because I want to tell you that none of those things I just mentioned can keep you out of Lazarus' position. None of those things can do that. All of us one day will be laid to rest in a tomb just like Lazarus. Might be in five minutes. I might fall over dead here while I'm speaking. Or it might be in 50 years. but all of us will be laid to rest one day like Lazarus. And the economy can't save you then, right? Washington can't do anything for you at that point. No check can save you. There is only one who can save you from death and from the fear of death, and his name is Jesus Christ. 
And I want to suggest to you that that is precisely what all of this ordeal with this virus is all about. God wants to wake us up and to shake us up in love. Do you trust God? Or are you questioning his motives like the folks here in this passage? Jesus, where are you? What are you doing, Jesus? <clears throat> Why didn't you stop this thing before it got here? Jesus, if only you would have... Do you trust God? Do you believe? Because if you believe, as Jesus says here in John 11, this virus will not end in death for you. But it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And even if this virus does end in death for some of us here, even though you die, you will live if you believe in Jesus. And how is Jesus glorified through things like this? Let's move to the third scene now, quickly, as we wrap up our message today. Verses 39 to 45. Jesus is now at the tomb and asks that the stone be removed, Martha says. Or excuse me, uh, Jesus says, remove the tomb. And then Martha says, Lord, by this time there's going to be an, an odor, a stench. For he's been dead for four days. And Martha here again seems to be struggling with some of these doubts, right? She's, she doesn't get what Jesus is doing here. Doesn't get his, his motives. Jesus, what are you doing? Jesus, please don't make a scene. It's really nasty in there. Step away from the tomb. Let, let's be on. Let's just be on with the service and, and with the prayers. Just get on with the service, Jesus. She did not understand who Jesus really was or what he was doing here and his purpose in all of this. But she's about to get a better idea, isn't she? Verse 40 and following, Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe. There it is again. All of this so that people would believe in Jesus. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man obeyed. Is that not amazing? The dead obeyed the voice of the Son of God. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. Do you see what's happening? Jesus performs this incredible miracle, a miracle which is a picture of salvation, dead people coming to life. That's what salvation is. Spiritually dead, being brought to life. That's what happens when a person is saved. However, that's not the only miracle that's happening here, this raising Lazarus from the dead. There's, there's two miracles here, many miracles really. But what, what are the other, what's the other miracle? What are the other miracles? The, the other miracles is the faith that is born out in this moment. That there are many who put their trust in Jesus as they observe all of this. That's a miracle. Notice what Jesus keeps saying, verse 40, believe and you will see the glory of God. And then in verse 45, the Jews believe because of the miracle. Right, over and over, Jesus says, this is so that you may believe. All of this was about moving people to see Jesus Christ for who he was. Jesus longed for them to know him and to understand who he was and to see his glory. It's the most loving thing a person can want for someone is that they would know God and know Jesus Christ. All of this grief and this pain was to be a window to see more of Jesus. It was to be a way for these people to know the love of God and the power of God which is greater than anything that this world can throw at you even death. All that being said, this moment, this virus or whatever it is that you're going through, that we're all going through, right? This suffering is common demand. We all suffer and, and face 
difficulties in this life. But whatever they are, they are not your enemy. These things are an opportunity, a window for you and for me to look to Jesus and to see the glory of God. What God wants from you more than anything right now is for you to put your trust in Him. Stop trusting in the things of this world. Stop trusting in fleeting things and things that will disappoint you and leave you empty. The things that can't save you from sin and death, the real enemies. Put your trust in Jesus Christ. And just like Lazarus, even if you die, you will live and you will see the glory of God. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, I pray that, that all within earshot, Lord, would, would believe. Just like those many Jews that were gathered that day when Jesus spoke these things and did these things there at the tomb of Lazarus, that miracle of faith that was born in their hearts, I pray that that, that miracle would happen right now as we pray and as they think about things, Lord, that you would stir us up as well, that we would be stirred, deeply, deeply moved, and we would put our trust in you, Lord Jesus. God, help us to turn from, from the constant struggle of putting our faith in the fleeting things of this world and to fully trust in Jesus Christ. And everyone who does that, even when he dies, if he dies, he will live. Amen.